Excellent. No other announcements? Good. Yeah, great. So <laughs> that is one of the reasons just why, you know, as a monk, you always try and see the best side of everything. So yes, that uh, I was going to go on a retreat for a week or two weeks, compelled by the government, but now you're free to do whatever you wish, uh, however you can serve. And to me, of course, and to many people, just like uh, Hock Chin and all the other members of the committee who are here, that it's an act of renunciation, of giving to other people, to help other people, to make sure others uh, can be served. And that gives me a lot of energy and happiness too. And that type of renunciation, giving for other beings, and not really thinking too much about yourself, is a wonderful way of meditating. Because we don't meditate to get something out of this. We meditate to disappear. So we don't want anything, we don't need anything, we can be totally free. It's a way otherwise called letting go. Give it a fancy word, renunciation. But let's call it letting go, renouncing. And of course we renounce the past and the future. That will look after itself. We can renounce this anything, wanting anything in the whole world. I'm just happy to be here in this moment wherever this here happens to be. And that gives you so much peace and inner contentment. And even if you are sick or tired, still you can just renounce trying to feel any, anything different. Just allow yourself to be opening the door of your heart to this moment. It's kindness, it's letting go, it's being very, very gentle to your body and mind. Now it may sound like cute, but it's also incredibly powerful and allows you to get so still and peaceful and see deeper in to things like tiredness or sickness and everything else in your life. So that's the meditation. So if you are ready, now please get yourself into your position and we can start our meditation. <coughs> One of the nice things about teaching is that I don't have to wear my mask properly. <laughs> I've got to talk. So, you sit down, allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can feel your body with more sensitivity. Mm. Just even for myself, we had a committee meeting from 6 p.m. and then talking to many of you and now carrying on talking. When I'm talking to others, you can't be as sensitive to how your body is. Once you are meditating with your eyes closed, after a short while you can really feel your body and when you feel your body, you can make sure you're sitting in the most comfortable position you can. And I develop myself just sweeping my awareness through my body, starting with the feet. How are my feet now? A lot of times people don't pay too much attention to their feet. At this particular time, all my attention, my mindfulness is focused just on the two feet. I get to know them very well. And I also find what's the best position for them. Making sure that's my toe is a bit squashed, so I'm going to move it. I just have. That feels much better. If I didn't notice these things at the beginning, what would happen is that they would cause pain later on. I notice my ankles, they're in good shape. You can sweep, just imagine, just like a light, just sweeping up your legs on either side. And I pause, if ever I come across a part of my legs which are hurting or squashed and going to cause me aches or pains later on. I'm sensitive to all of that. 
it is a way of increasing the power of your mindfulness. And when I get up to my knees, I've noticed that so many people have bad knees. All those years I've been meditating, honestly, my knees have never caused me any problem at all. Why? It's because I can understand my knees, I've been aware of them, mindful of them, kind to them, making sure I know how to sit in a good position. And if I do find any tension anywhere, I add this marvelous quality called kindness. Because with kindness and mindfulness, the two together are called kindfulness. And that kindfulness has a huge power to relax, to ease, to make every part of my body feel at peace. And I just keep my attention moving up my thighs to my butt, sitting on the cushion. Today, the cushion is well placed under my bottom. So I can actually leave it as it is today. It's not going to cause me an ache or a pain. And from there, I just, if you do have a bottom which is sore or tight, and maybe some clothing is folded underneath your butt. If you don't do anything about it now, it may cause a pain, which disturbs the peace of meditation later. So out of just basic kindfulness and care for yourself, you move, you adjust. And then I go up to my waist and my belt is a little bit tight, oh that's much better. making sure my waist is just nice and comfy. And I think, you, know, you notice, every week I just stretch my back at this point and then release it. I've seen animals doing that. It gives a sense of comfort to the back. So when you're meditating, it's not going to cause a problem for you. You care for parts of the body and the parts of the body care for you. Just like even animals, or even like ants we were talking about in our monastery a few days ago, if you're kind to them, it's amazing how they're kind back to you. And this is your own body. Give it this wonderful sense of awareness and kindness. And your body relaxes so much. And then you go to your torso, and all those little parts of me, which I don't pay too much attention to most of the day. My digestive tracts, the stomachs, one stomach, the lungs, the heart, livers and kidneys and stuff. I sweep my attention up my body. And if I come across anything which feels a little bit tight, unbalanced, or even painful. I pause there and give it this blast of loving kindness, of compassion, of softness, of care. I care for my body. The whole body is just pretty at ease at the moment. Up to your lungs. Just relax everything. For those of you who are concerned about respiratory diseases, things like COVID, just learn how to relax the lungs. How do you do that? Aware of them, kind to them, and find out what makes that air of your body feel relaxed. We go up to my shoulders, making sure they're nicely at, at ease. And then my arms and hands. 
And I've got my arms in a strange position today, but they feel comfortable. So I'm going to leave them like this. The posture, the way you adjust your body to begin meditation is not important except that you develop this kindfulness all the way. You know, many people just say that the important part of spirituality shows you is to learn how to be kind to yourself, not just kind to others. How to love oneself, not just to love others. And this is the start of learning how to appreciate your own body, to be kind to it, to relax it, with honesty, not with any narcissism, but with honesty and kindness, to be at peace with this body which serves you. And I go up to the, the neck again. I notice many times that people's neck goes forward or to the side. So I make sure that I move my back, my neck, sorry, my head back and forward until I can find the, the optimum position for balancing my head on top of my neck. When I find that, that's the position I'm going to try and let my head be on my neck. So there should not be any neck or shoulder pain because of that. And I go, to the front of my face because the emotions, especially negative emotions are expressed by the muscles of the face and so becoming sensitive to those muscles around the eyes and the mouth allows me to relax everything not just the physical feeling on my face but also the emotions which tend to interfere with the relaxation, relaxation of my face. Things like fear or negativity, anxiety, you can almost relax them totally away on your facial muscles. And lastly, I just become aware of my whole body just sitting here. everything in a good position, relaxed. If I find anything which needs a bit of attention, I will give that attention straight away and care for it. And if every time I do this on a Friday night or Saturday or at monastery, you get to the point which I got to a few moments ago, the body feels just so at ease. You get the delightful experience of relaxation. My body feels good. It's even I can discern pleasure with a relaxed body. And that leads you to deeper relaxation. Because it feels good, you don't need to worry, you don't need to do anything. And the awareness and the delight gets stronger. It's pretty strong this evening. And I stay with it. It allows me to be still, because I'm enjoying this. I don't want to go anywhere or think anything or change anything. I become still. And eventually, I go off to my inner world, the mind. How peaceful are you right now? What is peace? Be aware of peace. And be kind to be able to discover what makes you even more peaceful. What's the cause of stillness and peace inside? And after a while you soon know what peace is. 
the inner peace. And you just know what causes that peace to deepen. And eventually that peace too becomes delightful. To be able to sit here and have no thoughts to worry you. To be free of the burden of the past or the anxiety about the future. Just to be here at peace with the world. And don't try and use this power and clarity of peace to try and solve problems. It means you just don't respect the peace enough yet. Now is where your future is being made. Cultivating peace in this moment creates so much benefits for the future. Health benefits, psychology benefits, spiritual benefits. And as for the past, this is not the time to bring up the past. Please let that just settle and fade away. And in this moment, how do you feel inside? How joyful and free can that peace feel? Open the door of your heart to this moment. When you have peace and stillness there, when you can notice it, don't disturb it. It will stay with you. Peace is shy. If you try and describe it, if you try and give it a name, or many names, it will run away. Let it be. And you learn so much about what causes inner peace. For those of you who meditated a lot before, you probably notice a breath come up. If you do, just be with the breath, but make peace the most important. And see if you can observe, experience, peace get deeper and deeper. I'm going to be quiet now. When I speak again, you'll be close to the end of the meditation.
getting close to the end of the meditation period now. How do you feel inside? How peaceful, how delightful is that peace? A peace which depends upon nothing at all. Inside peace, contentment. Once that peace is delightful, it's easy to watch. Like watching a sunset or a dawn. It's peaceful. And how does your body feel? When you're inside the peace of the mind, as you come out, the body feels just so relaxed, so at ease. I feel like I can sit like this for hours. What worked for you today and what didn't? So we always learn every time we become more wise, more experienced in the ways of peace. What wonderful wisdom that is to learn how to be at peace. I'll now ring the gong three times. When the gong finishes sounding for that third time, it's a signal to open your eyes and come out from the meditation. So now those who need to go can go, those who need to come can come, those who are quite happy where they are can stay. As for me, I don't have a choice, <laughs> so I'm staying here. I give a talk this evening. So this evening's talk, I don't know why this comes up, I'll talk about peace. I was mentioning this today, early on, lunchtime, <coughs> when I say those uh, things which I bow to as a Buddhist monk. When I see a Buddha statue, I raise my hands, bow my head. It's a sign of it's something which I found very important. I have to keep reminding myself of its importance. So when I bow to a Buddha statue, I usually bow to, to virtue, peace and kindness. But the middle one is peace. And understand what peace is and how valuable it is. And even just, you know, in a community, in a family. And while you know, people sometimes miss that peace, you know, with living with another person. I often mention this, that when a person commits to form a relationship with another, they spend a lot of time choosing that person. But when it comes to the kids which come out of their family, they don't choose them at all. They just come out and you're stuck with them for life. Why is it that parents love their children unconditionally? they find it hard to do that to one another. And so that causes them a lot, of, a lot of stress in their lives. And 
sometimes I wonder why that is the case. And of course you all know just how peace and kindness go together. Because when you are kind to the people you share a building with, whether it's your family or the monks you know you share a monastery with, or the family which you share the house with, the office where you share the companions with, why is it we find it difficult you know, to find peace with those? A mutual respect. Imagine, imagine what it would be like you know, when you go to your family, you go to work, you come to a monastery and you really look forward to going there. And I think many of you do like going towards to our monasteries, male and female monasteries. You enjoy coming here. Why? Number one is because hopefully you never feel threatened, never feel criticized. Even though I told some of the monks, oh, why did I give you ordination? Oh my goodness, I must have been mad at that time. <laughs> I never, of course, say that. Because every person who I've ordained at Bodhinyana Monastery or other places, you always understand that these are human beings and human beings who are growing and given the right s supports, they can grow immensely. And I've seen that in my life. I've been a, a monk now for 47, 48 years. And I've seen so many people who you would have said were hopeless cases and grow so beautifully. Even today at the lunch time I was just talking about oh, just one of the uh, the cooks at Jhana Grove years ago. Jhana Grove is our meditation retreat center, which we built. I, yeah, I've got to say this, I designed it. And I just argued with others how to build this. And I was going to raise the funds for it, and so they just gave in in the end. And it's, uh, those of you who've been to Jhana Grove just know how just beautiful, comfortable it is for people to go on retreats, self-retreats, organized retreats, many, many things. But I also just know that, that one of the main reasons why it was successful is because it's comfortable and welcoming. And one of the things which I do there for those retreats, we have something which is called Noble Silence on those retreats. And those of you who don't know what the meaning of Noble Silence is, it is, there's no bells to wake you up in the morning, no bells to tell you when breakfast is. Everybody knows when breakfast is. <laughs> no bells to tell when you have to come to this meeting or that meeting. Because to me, bells mean compulsion. It's a signal that you have to go and meditate now, you have to go to sleep now, you have to get up now. Instead of that, people feel welcome to come. And when they want to come up to meditate, they can come up to meditate. If they need to sleep all day, please sleep all day. That you're welcome to be aware enough of your body and mind to adjust appropriately. No two people are ever the same. So why do we have to make everything the same for everybody? You have to get up at this time, you have to go to bed at that time, you have to... D all of that sort of compulsion, that force, was lacking something called kindness and wisdom and sensitivity to your own body and mind. Strangely enough, when you were kind, you found that more people would actually come. They'd enjoy it more. Simply because they could adjust themselves to what was needed to be done. So little by little, you realize that peace comes from kindness. If you're kind to your body and kind to your mind and kind to all the people who come and visit you, come to stay at monastery, come here, come on a, a, a weekend, come to some of all the different courses which we do here. When you feel welcome, 
more people come. And just to make that point today, we're talking with someone who was uh, a former psychologist or psychiatrist over at Carnet Prison Farm. And you know, she, we're talking with her today at the, our lunch, Dana. And she was also reminding me about a person I, I talk about a lot. And that was one of the cooks at Jana Grove. Our retreat center, you know, you supply you with food. Often that people come and bring the food, like they do to the monks. For this particular retreat, we had a cook who was going to cook every day for nine days. Where was he coming from? He was coming from the prison up the road. He was an inmate at the prison. We invited him to come to cook, and he was an amazing cook. I just really loved the way just he made, especially I could always remember the pizzas he made. He made them just from flour, just from the bare ingredients. He would come early in the morning from jail in the prison truck, and then he would work his butt off making this delicious food for everybody, then clean up, then go back to jail every day for nine days. But I never told anybody what we were doing. They said, oh, this is a really good cook. Can he come and sort of cook on our retreat ne next week or somewhere? I never told him, he can't do that. He had special permission. And I, sometimes people, it's a long time ago now. But anyway, the, at the very end of the retreat, the meditation retreat, you know, after he'd finished and gone back to jail, I, I just told him who he was. And now he's back in prison again. You know, this is incarnate. And he said he had a wonderful time there, giving back to everybody. And I asked, what did he do? He was in there for rape. Ajahn Bam, you allowed, he was such a nice guy, and such a good cook. Why is it that we can judge a person for one or two bad things they do? He was on, on drugs at the time. He wasn't in his right mind. But now, you know now, he's, he's happily married, he's living a great life. He's done his time, and he you know, doesn't take drugs anymore, and he's having a wonderful time. But anyway, the point was, it was an exercise in trust, and in kindness, and acceptance. Just like each one of you who come in here, we don't ask about your morality, or your past, what you've done before, how you are now. You're accepted, you're, the doors of this hall are open to you, no matter who you are. We've had some interesting people come in here before. Oh, I shouldn't say all the things which they've done. <laughs> what about the things which you've done? <laughs> in other words, this beautiful acts of kindness Allow people to find peace in their life. Allow people to move forward in their life instead of always being, being burdened by the faults of their past. And quite frankly, those faults in the past are not that great. There's so many good things which they do. What was that story of, oh, there was one of these prisoners who was just so depressed and when I said, well, why are you depressed? Look, I'm in jail, I did a bad thing, I feel so terrible, this, my life is over, finished. And then usually I asked him, well, what good things have you done? Nothing. You must have done something good. No, nope, I'm a bad person. And then, and then he, he uh, wrote out, I wrote out this piece of paper, lying down the middle, now your name on the top, now, uh, on the left-hand side, write all the bad... I won't show it to anybody else. Write down all the bad things you've done, things which you've put, been put in jail for, and things which you did but weren't put in jail for. Put them all down, I won't show them to anybody else. He trusted me. That's one of the nice things about being a monk. People actually trust you, and you know, if that's what you say, that's what you're going to do. So he wrote all these things on the left-hand column, all the terrible stuff he'd done. He felt good about confessing, opening up. But then I asked him, on the right-hand side, all the good things you've done, nothing. 
No, oh, come on, you must have done something. The prison had a cat. And I knew that he looked after the cat. Did you give the cat anything this morning? He said, I gave it a saucer of milk. Put it down. I had to force him to put down and write down, fed the cat a saucer of milk. But then he found another thing you could put down afterwards. Once you break that damn wall, it was amazing all the kind, good things he'd done that past week. And he filled up the right hand side of that piece of paper. You know what I did next? Tore that paper down the middle. Threw away all the terrible things he did. And gave him the good things he did. Please keep this. Put it next to your bed in your cell. Photocopy it if you like. But please keep that. To realize you're not such a bad person after all. <laughs> you can understand why some people do get depressed. They've got no good feeling about themselves at all. They almost feel they don't deserve to be peaceful. That's a difficult part. Every human being deserves peace, kindness, joy. And that's what I, my job is, to share those come secrets. Not a secret, it's your birthright as a human being. You know, we live in a society where we don't allow mistakes. You did a mistake, a wrong thing, you're going to be punished for the rest of your life. And in Buddhism, it's even worse. If you've got a mind like that, please don't be a Buddhist. Because you have to be punished for the next life, and the next life, and the next life. Oh, it's really bad. But <laughs> instead of feeling like that, what about all the beautiful things? which you have done, all your kindness. Sometimes people feel it weird. They come in here and you know, monks, lay people, are kind to you. Oh, please come in. Because when you get kindness rather than criticism, it's an expression of, li of love. It's an expression of wisdom and it gives you peace in your own heart. All the stupid things which we do, put them aside. When I say in our culture we're not allowed to make mistakes, that's one of the great things I found in Buddhist culture. You are allowed to make mistakes. Because mistakes are one of the essential parts of learning and growth. We will all make mistakes mistakes in our life. Even Mr. McGowan, <laughs> Mr. Morrison, Mr. Trump, Mr. whoever. But the point is when we do make a mistake, a lot of people hide it or deny it or said it wasn't a mistake. But instead we acknowledge mistakes and we learn from them. We grow. It's mistakes which teach us about life. So instead of giving them a bad name, we let them be. It's one of the reasons why that one of my teachings is what I call the 70% rule, 70%. Because that came about, I was a school teacher for one year. That's why I realized as a school teacher, you can always notice all the naughty Buddhists always sit in the back, because that's where all the naughty children used to sit in my class. <laughs> that's only a joke. But one of the things which I had to do was to set a, a test. And part of that test was, you know, I didn't never set a test before. So I asked the senior teacher what to do. And they said, don't set it too hard, don't set it too easy. If it's too hard, it was in maths. If you set it too hard, so the average score is under 50%, nearly all your children, your students, will think it's too hard. 
if you set it too easy, so most people get 99%, 100%, that's a useless test. So if you can set it so the average score is about 70%, that would mean that many of your students will think, yes, I can do maths, I'm good at it, 70%, that's a good score. And the 30% where they make mistakes, that is the important part for me, their teacher. I can learn what I thought they understood, which they didn't understand. And that's what I will teach in the next lessons. It wasn't as if they couldn't do maths. It was as I assumed they knew, but they didn't. And little by little, I realized that 70% rule was good for the whole of life. If you're looking for a partner in life, if you want one which is 100%, you'll be wasting your time, you'll never get anywhere in life. Why? Because you're not 100%. <laughs> so if you're looking for a partner in life, look for one who's about 70%. 30% false, 70% okay. Is that okay? 70%? That's enough. <laughs> Because that is real life, and the 30% where we make mistakes, we learn and grow from. That's really important in life. As a scientist, as a theoretical physicist at Cambridge, it's the mistakes where people get great breakthroughs. Several times, I couldn't believe this. Okay, it's a rich university. But several times I was in the lab there and something went bang! And one of the machines blew up. Honestly. But you know, fortunately the, you know, no one was injured. But the people who were running that lab never criticized those experimenters. They say, well, it didn't work this time, but try again. In other words, you're allowed, when you have experiments, when you're investigating life, when you're exploring new parts of science, new parts of the world, it's okay to make mistakes. Because that is the main part where we learn and grow. So that's one of the reasons why peace doesn't mean you just stay in one place and just don't go anywhere because of fear of making mistakes or other people think of you. In this room, you're allowed to make Mistakes. <laughs> Which means that people feel welcome. Which means that monks, nuns at monasteries, they feel that they're understood, they're trying their best, but they're not always perfect. When they do make a mistake, they are still accepted. They're not kicked out. Not a bad mark against you. Therefore today you can't eat or something. I wish they did have that rule and made a mistake you couldn't eat today. That would be one excuse to go on a diet. <laughs> but anyway, instead of that, we have this beautiful kindness where many, many of those monks feel welcome. Many of you feel welcome. Which means that it's a different way of looking at life. Even those prisoners I wasn't going to tell this story, but it comes up, it fits in really well. One of the greatest acts of praise which I've ever received was from a prison officer. And that prison officer, this was over in the prison in Canning Vale, they just used to call it Canning Vale Jail years ago. And I used to go there once a week. And this prison officer said, can you please come back? I said, no, I'm too busy, I've got too many other things to do these days. I'm looking after monks monastery, nuns monastery, monasteries over in Melbourne and other places and other Buddhist societies. He said, oh please, come back. I said, I'll send somebody else. And they said, no, you have to come. I said, why me? I complained. And the prison officer then said, I've been working in this prison most of my professional life and I'm about to retire, another nine months, ten months. 
I've noticed that every prisoner who comes to your classes, every one of them never comes back again. Zero recidivism. He said, this is weird. I've never seen this before. We need you to come back again, please. And my res response to that was, you know, going back and thinking, why me? What have I done which is anything special? And I realized afterwards, it's just that kindness and non-judgmentalism. Many of those prisoners have made terrible mistakes. But I can still see something beautiful and good in them. They were welcome. And we were kind to them. And this lady today told me, because she was a psychiatrist, I said, how many of those prisoners loved me in that jail? It was actually in Carnage Jail where she went to. And even the times when there was any trouble in that jail, I was probably the safest person in that jail. So some of the guys I knew, they were just really big guys. They would do anything for you. Because somehow or other you've seen some kindness in them, some goodness in them, which they couldn't even see in themselves. But after a while then they could start to see they weren't just all bad. There's some lots of good stuff inside of them and they became great human beings. I don't know why anybody wants to reject a friend in your life, a family member, someone you know, you've grown up with. Yes, they may have hurt you, but how much kindness have they shown you as well? How much goodness have they got inside of them? If you start seeing that goodness and kindness, oh my goodness, you can't have an enemy anywhere in the world. And when you're with them, they may be quite mean and, and tough to others, but then they can never be kind and mean to you. I was told one of the stories from Carnet, because you know, she was just saying, she knew all those stories as well, because she was there at the time the psycho psychiatrist, and one of them was the, the cow that cried story. It's a beautiful story. And I just told her some of the other details which she hadn't known, because one day this guy came in to my meditation class, and he had a very thick Belfast accent. I didn't ask him what side he was on, Protestant or Catholic, you could see just how big he was and how many scars he had on him. He was a very violent looking man. And then he said, he started swearing at me, God's own effing truth, he used to kept on saying, that he was first stabbed when he was six years of age. I remember that he's saying this, well, wow. He was in school when an older bully said, give me your money for dinner. He said, no. The bully didn't ask twice, just took out a knife and stabbed him in the arm. And with blood pouring out from the wound, he ran out of the schoolyard in Belfast, in a poor part of Belfast, to his father's house, just round the corner. Not a house, but just his small tenements. His father was poor, out of work. Daddy, I'm bleeding. A six-year-old. And what did Daddy do? Daddy didn't even bind the wound up. He just went to the kitchen, took out a knife, and told his son to go and stab the boy back. That's God's own effing truth, said this man. I always remember those words. Please excuse me for even intim intim in intimating them. But you can understand just how he was brought up. And he confessed he had murdered human beings. Now he was in jail. And in Carnet Prison Farm, his job was to be the one who slaughtered the cows. They had a, a slaughterhouse there. And apparently he said that many of those prisoners would fight for that job. To me it was a stupid way of trying to rehabilitate prisoners, give them the job to slaughter animals. But anyway, he described what it was like. These very strong 
um, stainless steel bars, just they were narrowing like a funnel, because whatever animal was being slaughtered that day, they would know what was going to happen. They'd try and escape, but they couldn't. And they were funneled in until they got just the one animal at a time. And he stood on this little platform above with the electric stun gun. One shot to stun, because they didn't stay still, they were moving. Two shots would kill. And when that happened, that's how they, they killed the animals. Bang, bang. And this day, one of the cows came in, different than any other cow I'd ever seen. Instead of struggling, this cow came in silently and just positioned itself voluntarily in the correct place and lifted up its head and stared at its executioner, this prisoner. And he said, God's own effing truth, this was happening. He didn't know what to do. The eye, the eyes of the cow were staring at the eyes of this very violent man. And he said that in those situations you're so confused, you just time doesn't have much meaning and just seconds tick by. But then what he did notice in one of the eyes of the cow, water started to well up above the lower eyelid. And so so much water welled up, it overflowed the eyelid and started trickling down the cow's cheek. The cow didn't move. And the prisoner couldn't move either, he couldn't pull the gun. And you notice the same happened in the second eye. Liquid welled up and welled up until that overflowed the eyelid. That cow was crying. This was a very violent man. He threw down the gun. He swore again, that effing cow is not dying. He couldn't pull it. And he said to me with a big smile and a grin on his face, I'm a vegetarian now, he said. <laughs> I remember him saying that. Just the cow that cried had changed this very violent man's life, had touched him deep and changed him. That's the power of kindness. The power of punishment, putting yourself in jail for a while, doesn't really help much at all. Punishment, guilt, self-punishment, is nowhere, nowhere near as powerful as kindness. That's one of the reasons why we try to be as kind as possible to everybody who comes into this room. And with that kindness, that heals so many people. Kindfulness is not just a magic word. It's actually a thing which you can give to people. And, oh my goodness, all those years, given kindfulness to any diseases in my own body, or diseases in other people's bodies, that kindness is so immense. If you've got a, a pain somewhere, you give it incredible kindness. Of course I've been practicing this most of my life, so that is very strong in me. And okay, here we go, another old story. Time when I had food poisoning. That if you've ever had food poisoning, it hurts like hell inside. You have spasms, which are unendurable. And this was happening after one meal, I haven't got a clue what I ate. So often when people give you food as a monk, you don't know what's inside it. And so you do eat it. And when you ate this food, something was off in it, because when I went back to my cave where I live, many of you have been inside my cave. Let's have a look. It's the most visited bedroom in the whole of probably Perth. <laughs> but anyway, this particular time, 
after a little while the tummy ache was getting so strong he started getting the cramps <coughs> much louder than that <coughs> it was automatic so after a while I just thought should I go down and call an ambulance but you know we don't have telephones in caves and from the cave to the where the telephone was, and it took me about five minutes probably if I went down there. And I remember in emergencies calling ambulances in the past for other monks who were sick. You go there and you say, um, can you please come to Bodhinyana Monastery? He said, where's that? He said, is it serpentine? Where's that? Honestly, they didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that funny, but anyway, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I remember somebody went crazy in monastery. And we called the ambulance, we called the pet team first of all. And the pet team came, we had, they said we can't actually even address this because they were violent, we had to get the police. So I had to call the police and send from Armadale. Can you please come to Buddhist one? Where's that? It's Serpentine. They went all the way past Serpentine Dam. They didn't know how to get there either. So that took an hour, an hour and a half to get there. So anyway, in the end, <laughs> I thought, oh, just, no, no need to get the police or ambulance. So I was in my cave. <coughs> because I was in the cave, no one could hear me. I could hear myself. And so, oh, come on, Ajahn Brahm, you know, use your meditation, for goodness sake. And that was just so wonderful. Get these contractions. And instead of fighting or getting scared of it, you're just with it, totally at ease with it, making peace, giving it kindfulness. Body, that's just the way you're dealing with this problem. That's fine by me. You know, when you don't react with negativity, but you react with kindness to this, the cramps got less, less intense. I remember just being aware, very fully aware of the cramps in my tummy. And they only got, you know, only slightly less than the last time. But that was encouraging. The next time, slightly less again. Slightly less again. Slightly less again. It took me about 40 minutes. But after 40 minutes, there was no cramps at all. Totally vanished. And I wasn't making this up. It was real food poisoning. And then it had totally gone. After 40 minutes, slowly. And I felt so blissed out afterwards. But that's actually how things happen. You can do that. Of course, I started wondering, those were bacteria. You know, some bacteria were causing havoc to my tummy. How on earth can you relax so much make peace with it so much that it totally disappears. And then being a scientist before, I'd seen bacteria in the microscope, little blobs with all the tentacles on them, I forget what they were called, the tentacles. But anyway, I just imagined that every one of those little blobs, or bacteria, whatever type it was, all had their tentacles crossed in full lotus and were all meditating, <laughs> which was why they, I'd made peace with them, they were making peace with me, and they weren't sort of wrecking my tummy. <laughs> that, that's actually a bum, okay, I'll just try to make some fun out of whatever you experience, but it worked. And that's always worked ever since. Whatever problem physical which I've experienced, you can always just be kindful to it, and make peace with it, and it disappears. It's weird, but really fun. So this is just a way that when we understand what peace is and how we can make use of it for anything. Well, one of the things we were just talking about earlier with a few people was about you know, even things like depression. In COVID times, there's many more people experience depression. And somebody was asking me, what actually is it? What's one of its main causes? Why is there more people suffering depression in today's world than I would say ever before? That's my own personal opinion. One of the reasons is because we set our expectations so high. 
mostly to try and please other people. What you think is expected of you as a human being, as a man, as a woman, or LGBTQIA+, what's expected of you? And you try so hard to fulfill other people's expectations. It could be your parents' expectations, your mother's expectations, your wife's expectations, your kids' expectations, your senior monk's expectations. All those expectations which your parents put on you, or you put on yourself. You actually do try hard, too hard. And after a while you find out you can't meet those obligations. What you think is obligations, you try so hard you tie yourself out spiritually, emotionally, you get exhausted. And you keep trying. Please, don't get spiritually exhausted. Because once you get below a certain level, it's very hard to get up again. That depression becomes just so unpleasant. You can't do anything, nothing excites you, nothing, you don't enjoy anything. You know, even just the beautiful weather, it's just too hot. Soon you say it's too cold. People are very nice to you, just what do you want out of this? We get so negative, even the most delicious food just tastes bland. And people are so kind, so good, Blech, get out of here. One of the nicest things to overcome depression is don't fight, make peace with how you feel. Be kindful to it. Sometimes that kindness is find difficult because you think that you stigmatize low energy. You feel I shouldn't be like this. Instead, you do feel like this, be real, accept it, make peace with it, it doesn't last. And after a while, when you make peace with depression, your energies start to come back up again. Many, many, many times, there's, I should have been depressed so many times. So much of what you try to do doesn't work. You think, Ajahn Brahm, how can you say that? You know, you've been a successful monk, got nice monasteries, people come and listen to your talks. They listen and they actually even laugh at the bad old jokes you say every week. <laughs> What's a bad old joke today? I did just say the one about the, oh here we go, <laughs> about the Englishman, the uh, Singaporean and the Australian in a pub. Please excuse me, the pub. I don't go drinking, of course, but that's you know, just part of the joke. And they say, I saw this, this Englishman, Singaporean and Australian in a pub. And they saw this person in the corner there with long hair and a beard and a white gown. And the Singaporean said, see that person over there? I think that's Jesus. I'm getting into trouble for this, I'm, I'm sure, but I started, so who, who cares? Actually, I'm going to, I'm going over uh, to another state tomorrow, so I think it should be okay. <laughs> it's Melbourne. And that's Jesus over there. I said, oh, it can't be. Let's go and find out. So he went over there. And sure enough, the guy's got holes in his hand. He said, oh, you're Jesus. You know, my, my father goes to your church every Sunday. So, you know, have a beer. So the Singaporean buys him a beer. Oh, thank you, mate. <laughs> and then... He says to the other person at the table, to the Englishman, so this, that is Jesus over there. Ah, it can't be. Yeah, it is. Go and have a look. So he goes over there and he said, you Jesus? Yes, yeah, my second coming. So he said, oh, have a beer. So he buys Jesus a beer. And then he said, it really is Jesus. And then the Australian says, well, actually, I'm not a Christian myself, but every Saturday, my wife goes to church and that made me I have a free day then. I can go watch the football on TV or anything I want. So, you know, you do a lot of good for me, Jesus. So <laughs> he goes up and buys Jesus a beer. Thank you. And then when the, Jesus finishes three beers, 
he goes up to those three people and says to the Singaporean, thank you so much, your generosity is very wonderful. And I can see that you've, you've got migraine, haven't you? You've got a headache. So I've had a migraine for years and years mm. and years. Jesus touches him on the head and the migraine goes away straight away. It's a miracle. He goes to the Englishman and said, you've got a bad tummy, haven't you? You know, you could suffer from indigestion. Yes! And he touches him on the tummy. And the indigestion goes away. So it's amazing. And then he goes up to the Australian. And the Australian says, keep your hand off me, mate. I'm on workers' compensation. <laughs> How you laughed, that's very kind of you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be in trouble, I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> little by little, that kindness, and I hope you have kindness to me, but forgive me <laughs> for that terrible joke. That little kindness and friendliness, that is what overcomes depression. You, fact, you accept things, you're not fighting, you don't feel that something wrong with you. You know that so many times when people even meditate, they don't get deep and the main reason is they think they don't deserve it. Do you deserve to be happy? Of course you do. I've given lots of people happiness certificates. I don't know why I need to do that. I get them a nice certificate and I just write on there, I hereby grant Hock Chin, our president, permission to be happy. For any reason or no reason at all, for the rest of your life. Signed, Ajahn Brahm, your spiritual director. Well, you need a license to get married, don't you? You need a license to drive a car. You need a license, I don't know whatever licenses you need to build a house. So why don't you need a, why can't we give you a license to be happy? In other words, it's just reinforcing the fact that you have permission. It's okay to be happy, to be blissed out. Why not? Instead of always feeling negative about yourself or about life. That means that you can overcome depression pretty easy. This is one of the reasons why many negative things have happened to me in my life. Even that one time when I really thought the monastery had totally burnt down in a big crown fire in 1991, I think it was. Huge fire. 46.5 degrees before the fire came. Hottest day at the time ever recorded in Western Australia, before the fire came. And I was there at the time, huge blaze. I couldn't understand how anything could survive that. But it did. You prefer, you were ready to let the whole thing disappear and start all over again, all that hard work, why not? Little by little you understand what depression was and how to overcome depression. Just let it be. like. Seasons of the year. And little by little, you didn't get depressed anymore. It's a wonderful way of dealing with life. Have you ever suffered from depression? Are you suffering from depression now? Why? Lower your expectations and give yourself more freedoms. Don't stigmatize yourself. Learn how to appreciate the wonderful things we already have. You've got a Buddhist society where you're welcome no matter who you are. Where you don't have to pay anything. Isn't that wonderful? Many things in life people have to pay for. This place, years and years and years ago, there's many stories like this. This time, this, it was a, I can tell by the accent, it was an, a Polish lady called said, are you giving a meditation talk tonight? I said, yeah. I said, how much do you charge? I said, nothing. She replied, well, you can't be any good then. <laughs> so I never say that anymore. Another lady called, 
teaching meditation tonight? He said, yes. How much do you have to pay to get in? I said, you don't pay anything to get in. You don't understand how many dollars and cents do you have to pay to get in? I said, nothing. And there was this wonderful pause, which I always remember. Well, what do you get out of it then? And honestly, the answer is I get happiness. That's what I get out of this. Joy. Giving to others. Helping whichever way you can. Is one of the best medicines to overcome depression. Giving, caring, serving. And also, telling jokes. And letting people or hearing people laugh at them. I can't still believe why you keep laughing, but thank you for doing that. <laughs> okay, so that's enough for this evening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So got any questions from overseas? Any threats for that joke about Jesus? I'm going to be in trouble for that, I'm sure. Hmm? Here we go. Very good. Okay. Oh, Edie from Indonesia again. Is it possible to use your talk as a meditation object? As I feel calmer every time I listen to Dharma talk. And is there a connection between feeling and thoughts? Of course, feelings and thoughts. If you feel nice and peaceful and calm, you don't get angry at people. You have nice positive thoughts. If I use my meditation to feel calm every time, sure. Also, there's many people who use my meditation talks so as they can fall asleep at night. <laughs> Honestly, that's true. I gave a, a, a lecture in Berkeley in California some years ago. It was part of a big conference we did over there, only about two or three years ago. And the MC who introduced me, and this is a young woman, maybe 30 or so, she said, I now like to introduce you to Ajahn Brahm and I go to sleep with Ajahn Brahm every night. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm a good monk. <laughs> and what she, she said, no, she's a busy lady, she listens to one of the talks at night time and that sends her into a nice peaceful sleep. Is that good or bad? I don't know, but anyway. She said thank you for that. So, <laughs> so yes, please, whatever works, please make use of. So, now, however it works. I mean, some of the kids, mum listens to the talks, so the kids listen to the talks, and mum comes down, and so the kids come down, and some of the kids, and these are young people, three or four years of age, and they listen to my talks at night time, that's the only way they can go to sleep at night. I don't mind. Uh, somebody from Indiana, USA. Though I have made progress in other areas, I typically feel what I do, have accomplished, etc., is not enough. How can we learn to be content? Oh my goodness, you'll never ever be able to do enough in the world. Oh, I just work so hard. Oh, I, you, I, I, I showed a few people the photograph of myself 37 years ago. It's so thin. If anybody wants to see, I can show it to you afterwards. That was 37 years ago. I worked really hard building Bodhinyana Monastery. Was that enough? No. Then you built Jhana Grove Meditation Retreat, Retreat Center for all of you. Was that enough? No. On Saturday, I'm going to Melbourne because we're building a retreat center there. Oh, how many retreat centers do I have to build? How many nuns and monasteries do you have to set up? Oh, how many city centers here do you have to build? Oh. Sometimes we're having a, an AGM for our, uh, Buddhist Society of West Australia on the 30th of April. We decided that date, 30th of April, AGM. And people say, oh, I can't serve on the committee. I've already served you know, a couple of years. I've served 37 years on this committee. 37 years I've served on the committee of the Buddhist Society of West Australia. It's 
good fun. I really enjoy that. So once you're in the Buddhist Society, West Australia Committee, you should never resign. <laughs> Just stay there until you're dead, <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> I enjoy, I've got a different attitude towards it. I just I love serving, wherever you can. Anyway, there's more to accomplish in life. Of course there's always more, but what you've accomplished already is great, marvelous. Never think of, this is this old saying, that um, never allow what you want. No, sorry, I got that one wrong. When you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. I love that saying. When you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. How much, how big is your house? Do you want another house? When you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. How's your partner in life? Yeah, you're not the best, but you know, when you want something more, you can't enjoy the one you already have. How's your monastery? How's the finances? You always want something more. When you want something more, you can't appreciate what you already have. Always remember that. In Bodhinyana Monastery. Oh, he worked so hard. It's so, as soon as you build another hut, another monk ordains and moves into it. I don't know, it's just so hard to keep sort of spare huts around. Same in Dhammasara. So anyway. So you typically feel what I do, I have accomplished it, so it's not enough. Oh, come on. Just say, this is good enough. Lower expectations. That's one of the meditation mantras which I use. This is good enough. You're sleepy. This is good enough. You're blissing out. This is good enough. Never want anything more at any time in your meditation. When you want something more, you miss out on the meditation going deeper. So you're content and easily satisfied, not proud and demanding in nature. That's the English translation of part of the Metta Sutta, which we chant often. To be proud and easily contented. No, no, so that's wrong. I got that wrong. Be content and easily satisfied, not proud and demanding in nature. Oh, we've got uh, one from Turkey here. Dear Ajahn, although I try to concentrate on my breathing during meditation, my f heart feels quite heavy. Any idea why? Concentration is too forceful. You're wearing out your heart. Instead of trying to concentrate on your breathing, just be still. Let the breathing become beautiful. And you just watch it so easily. I never try and concentrate. If I did, these retreats which we lead and the retreat centers we build. I'm going over to Melbourne tomorrow to help you know, build this Newbury Buddhist Monastery Retreat Center. It's a retreat center. If it's about concentration, it will be called Newbury Concentration Camp. <laughs> you get the message. So you don't concentrate on your breathing. Just as I mentioned during the meditation, just develop kindfulness on your body. And your body gets so relaxed and beautiful. It's easy to watch the body. This meditation I just did over there, it was a struggle for me to let the body go and just to go into the breath because my body was just so nice to watch. But you know, I was teaching you, so I had to go into the, into the mind pretty quickly. Otherwise, I'd have stayed there with my body much longer and spent much longer with my, my peacefulness inside. So imagine just how beautiful peace is. Then you don't need to actually to uh, to focus on it, it just draws you in. Just sort of that story of that one lady, I think I told this last week, I don't know. But this one lady who was one of our members years ago, Judy, and she uh, went over to, um, to Dhammasala, not Dhammasala, Dhammasala, that's where the Holiness put the Dalai Lama lives. 
and just went to uh, try and get an interview with him. Had to wait for a few days. But over there, he would, she would get up early in the morning and meditate. She was meditating in the room one day, and then somebody came and sat next to another meditator. And she made the mistake of looking who it was. It was Richard Gere. She was single. <laughs> and then she didn't have to focus on looking at Richard Gere, she just couldn't stop. <laughs> Things which are attractive and beautiful, you don't need to concentrate on. It pulls your mind to it. And this is like the breath or the body, when it gets beautiful, delightful. You don't have to focus on it. It pulls you to it. Beautiful music, you don't have to focus on it or concentrate on it, it just pulls you in. That's what happens with the breath when it's delightful. You can't stop watching, it's gorgeous. Then your heart doesn't feel heavy at all. It feels so light, it feels effortless. Rasi from Sweden. How can we handle laziness? Third of the five hindrances. It's, uh, this is sloth and torpor. I think I procrastinate my work too much. Even procrastinate to meditate. Instead, prefer watching TV or sleeping. <laughs> watching TV. You know, for years I hadn't seen a TV when I was a monk in Thailand. I remember just going to, after about seven years, visiting uh, UK, visiting Scotland. I remember seeing through two doorways a TV for the first time in seven years, and oh, that was just so hard for my brain. The images were just so changing so fast. And also, just the colors were so intense. Ugh. And I actually recalled, recoiled from it, because it was just too intense, the whole thing. So next time you look at a TV, look at a bit of a distance from it, and see what it really is and just how it is actually disturbs your mind. And go to a monastery or a retreat center and just have a week without any TV or looking at the internet. Bodhinyana, Jhana Grove Retreat Center, when we built it at that place, we found out that the, uh, the internet receptivity was very, very poor. Those of you who stay at that place just know how difficult it is to get a signal in Jhana Grove Meditation Retreat Center. That's one of its best attributes. <laughs> People know how to get a signal, they have to walk up to the top of the hill somewhere and they can get a signal, but at the moment it's, it's just an internet black spot or silent spot. Isn't that wonderful? People can't contact you. Yay! And if anyone goes on a retreat there, please, you can always tell the caretaker or the manager, sort of, look, you know, if, you know, if I'm needed at all, I've told my family, they can always call the retreat center and they will contact me. So you don't have to keep looking at the, your emails. Oh, is anything happening? Is everything okay? Is this? No, don't be like that. Have the wonderful gift of silence, of peace. You deserve that. So, how do you handle laziness? Ask your body and mind what it wants, what it really wants. A lot of times it needs some rest. Give it rest. So often, when I have a chance to be on a silent retreat for myself, sometimes I ask my body, what do you need? And sometimes, it's weird, it tells me, I need a rest. And I go into my room, it doesn't matter what time of the day or night, and I lay down and sleep. And I know the difference, if I've got it wrong, I just lay down and can't go to sleep at all. I just misunderstood my body and mind. But other times it's weird. I just, so I already slept. You go down, you lay down, you're out immediately. And I wake up half an hour, 45 minutes later, and I feel so, so fit and healthy. I work with my body and mind, I understand it. I understand when it needs a rest, when it needs some energy. When I do that, that's why I don't get sick. 70 years of age now, and I've had been pretty healthy all my life. 
I think that's one of the reasons I understand my body and I work with it. Sometimes I think those times, they're rare, when I take a rest at weird times of the day or night, take a rest, my body is saying there's some sort of disease which I haven't recognized yet, and it is telling me, take a rest and we'll sort it out for you. Work with my body. Procrastinate, look, a lot of things it's worth procrastinating on. Don't do today what you can put off until tomorrow because you might die tonight. <laughs> it's one of my sayings. Because what is really important in life? It's not procrastination, it's like prioritizing what's really important. Things like your family are important, your health is important. Other stuff you don't really need to do, really. So find out what's important for you. Give that priority, then you're never a procrastinator. I'm a procrastinator. I put off procrastination until tomorrow. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so a, that was a joke. <laughs> yeah. put, off, put off procrastination, yes? Yes, sorry. The Buddhiana, the main meditation hall, uh, I find that it's so peaceful and mm. full of energy and you can gain peace and calm. Oh, yeah. Perhaps some of the people here who wish to yeah. you make use of the hall. Yeah, look, please, that if ever you go to visit Bodhinyana Monastery at Serpentine, it's usually always open. And many times people have gone into that meditation hall and there's nothing else going on there. And they can get into a nice peaceful meditation where other places they can't. And one of the reasons is, is because there's lots of very powerful monastics have meditated in there over the years. And they do, do leave a sort of a, what of anything else, like a good aura there. Whether you believe it or not, there's relics of the Buddha in there. And there's very powerful energy, especially in the front of that hall. Feng Shui master years ago came into that hall. I was away somewhere else and I didn't have permission, I didn't know they were visiting. And they were blown away, the front of that meditation hall was a huge Feng Shui. It's huge power. And you can sit there and you can feel it. It's a great place to meditate. So that's a wonderful place to do some meditation. There's some places that do have high energy I say that as a theoretical physicist, I don't know why, but you feel it. And that makes a great energy. So anyone who has the opportunity, you ask people to be in there, and they notice how great the energy is. However, I do remember once, first couple of years there, uh, I was um, in the, the library just behind the hall. And I was, you know, I was aware enough Somebody had gone into the main hall and they were making a noise. I thought it must be some sort of chanting or whatever. But I just went in to check. It was a young man and young woman. They weren't chanting at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what they're up to, just about. And I said, look, you know, this is a monastery. You know, there's a place over the road, look out or something. If you want to make love, go there, but please not in front of the Buddha. Honestly, that was what happened. <laughs> so you do see some weird things sometimes in Western monasteries, but say, so just over there, please. <laughs> so anyway, I chased them out. <laughs> that was years ago. Okay, yeah. So please you can go to Bodhinyana Monastery Hall, but please, you know, to meditate, not other stuff. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that. Any other questions before we totally finish off? Okay, thank you. How long am I going away? Just the future is uncertain, but it's likely to be um, coming back on the 3rd of March. 3rd of March, how many days is that from the... It's about 10 days, I think. 10 to 11 Thursday. Yes, yeah, about 10, 11, 12 days. And again, I was going to go an extra fortnight, but now I can't go on to quarantine anymore. <laughs> so that quarantine has been 
suspended from the 3rd of March. So anyway, it should be 10, 11 days. Should be on the board on the where's Ajahn Brahm, but now because the board is coming down, there'll be a lot of invitations to actually to go overseas as well. Many of the places I went before, you know, over to Malaysia and Singapore and to Thailand and Hong Kong and, and so many other places. And it's nice to be able to serve them as well when we possibly can. And to UK. So that's going to be very difficult the next few weeks, sort of saying no to the invitations. You have to because you can't be in two places at the same time. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so let's pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha now. Patipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Very good. Very good. 